Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Whitley and I am very pleased to be able to introduce today's conference. I'm a trustee of the Balfour Project and I've spent over half my working life working on this particular issue. Yesterday, if you are fortunate enough to have been among us, was really a very moving and exciting day. I think we heard a great deal of thought-provoking information from our speakers about the observance or the lack of it of the rule of law in Israel and Palestine. Today, we're going to be going down more into the details of what actually, um, of what actually is happening on the ground in the region. We're going to be hearing first from the man who is probably the most authoritative and independent source of information on human rights in the area, and that is Professor Michael Link, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. He will then introduce a panel of four experts, um, people living and working on the ground, who can tell you what the situation is. And from there, we will then move on to the second half of the conference, which is going to cover Britain's responsibility. As you may know, the Balfour Project is an organization that focuses on Britain's role, its historic role and its role today. And it looks at how we can educate the British public and advocate for the British government to take a stronger, more independent, more forceful position to be able to help try to promote equal rights and an end to, to occupation. So that's why in the afternoon session, in the second session this afternoon, we're going to be having uh, Lord Alderdice, um, appropriately enough, a, um, a veteran of the Northern Ireland peace process, a um, member of the Liberal Democratic Party, former Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly. And he's going to be leading a discussion which will begin with Jack Straw, the former UK Foreign Secretary and uh, former um, Home Secretary. And he will then introduce a panel of members of parliament who will debate the issues. I shall come back at the end in order to read a closing declaration from the Balfour Project. And it's a declaration which we're issuing in our own name. The speakers and other participants are not associated with it, but it's a call on our government to make a number of actions which we think that are appropriate for them to do so, given the values that they espouse, that they uphold. So without any further ado, I'm now going to turn over to Michael Link to give his presentation. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the uh, session today. I want to thank the Belfour Project <clears throat> and particularly Sir Vincent Fain for the invitation to be able to speak today. Today, I'm going to speak on some of the leading aspects of international law <clears throat> as it uh, play, applies to the occupation. There are a number of issues that I will address, but a number of issues I won't address, both because of time and because they've been spoken to by the many, many excellent speakers we either uh, had on the project yesterday or will be speaking later today after me. Um, my argument today uh, is going to be based on two points. First, that this occupation is thick with laws, which Israel, the occupying power, defies. And secondly, I will be talking about what is the key missing aspect of this very briefly on accountability, knowing that one of our subsequent panel speakers will be addressing it in a more fulsome fashion. So I would like to be able to introduce my uh, slideshow for you today. Um, and, and take you through this, uh, through, the, through the magic of, uh, of, video, of uh, visuals. And what I first, let me just be able to forward this. So the, the first of many important things that I wanna be able to convey today um, is how unequal and how asymmetrical this particular struggle is. Militarily, Israel is a nuclear power with the strongest armed forces in the region. Uh, and it has a, has a very close military alliance with the United States, the world's sole remaining superpower. While the Palestinians have a, uh, a lightly armed uh, police force in West Bank and with low grade missiles in Gaza. Economically, as you see, Europe enjoys a, uh, sorry, Israel enjoys a European style standard of living with a gross domestic product per capita that's 12 times higher than the Palestinian standard. Territorially, 
um, Israel is the overwhelmingly dominant uh, political power between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River, with the Palestinians possessing only municipal-like authority in confined and scattered fragments of land that are disconnected from one another. Diplomatically, Israel has the enduring support of the US and to a lesser degree, the European Union, which tends to count for far more in current industrial relations, in, in international relations, than the large voting majorities uh, in the UN General Assembly who back the Palestinians. The one area where there is parity, where there is equity, is demographically. Uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs each have roughly 6.8 million people living between the Jordan and the, and the Mediterranean. Um, and the, the Palestinian population is steadily catching up. And at some point, either two years ago or two or three years from now, it's deemed to be that their um, population numbers will become numerically uh, superior to those of Israeli Jews in this particular area. This past Christmas, my brother gave me um, Barack Obama's memoirs as a Christmas present, and I immediately went to his section on the Israeli occupation. Uh, his rendition of the occupation is a very interesting mixture of a very standard recitation of Israel's founding, together with uh, some very sharp and wry acknowledgments of how the Palestinians have become the political orphans of the, uh, of the modern time. And I've included one of his uh, uh, interesting um, observations in the uh, in the panel here, um, and where he acknowledges that uh, the occupation by Israel is a violation of international law, uh, that it's widely accepted among the nations of the world, and he talks about the awkwardness, one one might say hypocrisy, that the U.S. often found itself in, that whenever they had were willing to raise issues with respect to human rights. Uh, uh, breaches going on in Russia or in China or in Iran, they would they would frequently be met back with, well, what about Israel and the Palestinians? And he said, as a result, our diplomats found themselves in an awkward position of having to defend Israel for actions that we ourselves wind up opposing. And I must say, the thought that came to me as I was finishing the reading of this section of his book is I wondered if he wouldn't have had a stiffer spine on this issue as president if he'd actually written his memoirs first and then read them once he became president uh, to have the benefit of the uh, of hindsight. So two of the areas that I won't, won't be able to talk to you today um, are about international humanitarian law and international human rights law. There are actually three areas of international public law that um, have a great pertinence to the Israeli-Palestinian -Pal conflict and to the Israeli occupation of, of Palestine, which is humanitarian law, human rights law, and international criminal law, uh, dealing with the uh, laws of uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes. I won't speak to that last uh, section because that goes to a, a very brilliant uh, pr presentation given yesterday by Professor Philip Sands. So when it comes to international humanitarian law, these are the laws of war and more particularly the laws of occupation. They are codified in several um, uh, cornerstone international documents, the 1907 Hague Regulations, the 1949 uh, four Geneva Conventions and the 1977 Additional Protocols as well as much of what's in those uh, documents has now been accepted as, uh, as constituting part of international customary law which binds everybody whether or not you have uh, you've actually adopted any or all of the uh, key IHL documents. So it, when we talk about occupation and particularly with respect to Israel and Palestine, the most important single document is the fourth of the Geneva Conventions from 1949, which offers uh, detailed protection of civilians under occupation. And it is the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is the institutional protector and interpreter of, uh, of IHL. And in 2004, during the uh, <clears throat> advisory uh, opinion given by the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the ICJ stated, among its other findings, that both international humanitarian law as well as international human rights law both apply to the conduct of the, of the occupation, and Israel is, is obliged to honor both. <clears throat> 
Now let's turn to international human rights law. Um, international human rights law obviously has to do with, with foundational human rights. So there are areas in which international humanitarian law, international human rights law wind up overlapping. But for our purposes, they are, they are meant to be thought of as two distinct uh, bodies, both of whom, by the way, they'll have a very common purpose in wanting to be able to protect the vulnerable in the most vulnerable of, of, uh, of circumstances. And both international humanitarian law and international human rights law offer a bestowable, a range of inalienable rights upon those that they seek to wind up protecting. So um, international human rights law is codified beginning with the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, which actually formally speaking is not law. It is simply a declaration of the UN General Assembly. But the fact is that virtually every one of the 30 uh, provisions in the Universal Declaration are now regarded by those who think about this as, as forming part of international law. Uh, as well, there are the two 1966 international covenants, one on political uh, rights, uh, political and civil rights, and the other on economic and social rights. Together, the 1948 Universal Declaration and the two 1966 international covenants are thought of as being the International Bill of Rights. And building upon that has been a series of other human rights treaties that have been adopted by the international community over the last 65 years, including uh, international treaties on women, on race, and on persons with disabilities, uh, among other rights. Israel is required, as stated by the International Court of Justice, uh, to fully respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of, of the people who are under occupation. Israel has argued that uh, human rights law does not apply to the occupied territory. Indeed, they, as we will see in a minute, they argue that uh, the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention doesn't apply either. This is, a, this is a pretty lonely position in international law as virtually the entire international community accepts that both branches of law apply in full to Israel's uh, administration of the occupation. Some of the foundational rights in international human rights law that wind up applying include the freedoms of expression, assembly, religion, and particularly the fundamental guarantees of equality and non-discrimination. And certainly when you read recent analysis of whether or not Israel is in compliance with the law, including the uh, very important uh, report released last month uh, by, by Human Rights Watch, they use the lens of both humanitarian law, but in particular international human rights law to be able to say that Israel's uh, actions on the West Bank and in East Jerusalem of, um, of maintaining separate rights, uh, separate living conditions uh, for its Israeli settlers, as opposed to the Palestinians living among them um, uh, on the basis of race, religion, political opinion, and the and equality and non-discrimination amount to uh, profound discrimination. Indeed, in the words of Human Rights Watch, it amounts to, uh, to apartheid. So you may ask yourself, what is the importance of law? Isn't this just something for academics and, uh, and um, diplomatic uh, lawyers to want to argue among themselves at conventions, but they have very little to do with actually trying to find peace on the ground. I'm going to come back to that argument a little bit later. Uh, so well, actually very quickly I'm in the next slide. But what I want to point out is the absolute centrality of ensuring that law is at the very center of how a, uh, an occupier conducts its occupation. Um, in, in, uh, in particular, I want to point out that there, that there is universal consensus with respect to the centrality of human rights law and humanitarian law in the conduct of the modern world. Virtually every country has signed on to the Fourth Geneva Convention. Most countries have signed on to the two 1966 uh, international covenants on human rights, and they have signed on to a, a, a many of the subsequent human rights treaties. Human rights and international law is now our common universal language. In a world that's divided by class, by race, by religion, um, and by, by other divisions, the one unifying feature that we all have is the fact that we've created this enormous body of international public law with the, with the uh, values of justice and equality 
at the very center of them. Everybody speaks in this common language to one another. Many don't obey what they've signed up to, but that in itself has a value. And since because they have signed up, they can be held to be named and to be shamed by saying, you're not following what you've agreed to on paper. Um, and this makes a powerful argument, in my mind, perhaps the most powerful argument to be able to challenge human rights abusers. And in this case, an abusive and acquisitive uh, occupying power. Um, the, and the large value of wanting to ensure that there's a rights-based approach that's at the very center of both the administration of the occupation and the international push to bring it to an end is that using international law would create a more level playing field between the very asymmetrical balance of power between Israel and the Palestinians. My core argument is that it's this very asymmetrical distribution of power that has led us to have one failed uh, peace initiative after another. And, that, and that's why I call my, my presentation today, Give Rights a Chance. If there is a rights-based approach that at the center uh, of any future international efforts, that would have a far better uh, uh, chance of being able to succeed. So when I look at, and I, several years ago, went back and examined all of the major um, uh, in more treaties, but either declarations or agreements or plans or proposals that were initiated um, from the beginning of the Madrid Oslo process in the early 1990s, right up to the Trump plan uh, released last year. The one consistent issue that you will see, the one constant theme through all of this is that international law and rights have been consistently sidelined through oh, this entire 30 year process, beginning with the, uh, the 1993 Declaration of Principles, right up until uh, the, the Trump plan, which was released uh, 16 months ago. Israel, with the support of the United Nations, sorry, with the support of the United States, has been vigorous in wanting to ensure that any parameters or any principles or agreement sideline international human rights and international humanitarian law. Why? Because they recognize themselves that their case is so weak uh, with respect to their obeying of, uh, of, both, of both sections of law. And indeed, if the parameters of a final peace settlement were framed entirely within the, uh, within the, the structure of international law, they would have to give up all of the gains that they think they have made in the 54 years of the occupation by creating all of these facts uh, on the ground. What sidelining international law has meant and what has been the theme throughout all of these interim agreements and, uh, and frameworks and proposals is that uh, because international law is not at the center of these, of these um, processes, it allows Israel to argue from the strength of already having annexed territory, of already having created 250 um, uh, settlements in the areas. Therefore, they're allowed to, to negotiate over their Ill, 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 illegal gains. If a rights-based approach had been put in and had been followed, Israel would have to bargain strictly from the 1967 borders. The, uh, the settlements would have to all be removed. All of the uh, annexations, in particular, the, uh, the formal annexations of the Golan and East Jerusalem would have to be undone, and all of its de facto annexation uh, attempts uh, in the West Bank would have to be undone as well. That would put the parties on a parity to be able to negotiate what a final peace agreement would look like. So in wanting to take you through the highlights of the main features of, uh, of law today, I've got four areas I'm gonna look at. And as I said at my very uh, opening remarks, there are some that I can't go through simply because of time, but also I'm assured that there have been or will be other speakers uh, during this, this uh, two-day conference who have addressed some of these other issues, most particularly dealing with uh, the International Criminal Court. So the first issue I wanna be able to, to tackle with you has to do with occupation. And this, of course, then has to do with the application uh, and uh, obeyance of the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949. Since 1967, the world community expressed through 
uh, dozens of, uh, of Security Council resolutions and hundreds of General Assembly and Human Rights Council resolutions has you almost unanimously accepted that Israel is an occupation of these territories and therefore the fourth Geneva Convention winds up applying. As you can see in the numbers I have on the right side of the screen, there are four fundamental features uh, that govern a, an occupation by an occupying power. First of all, the occupation must be temporary. And ordinarily temporary is meant by international practice, five to 10 years at the very most. Think of how long the Americans occupied Japan, roughly eight or nine years. Think of how long the Western allies occupied Western Germany after 1945. Again, roughly eight to 10 years. Think how long the Americans occupied Iraq. And again, eight to 10 years was the maximum period of time. Occupation, the laws of occupation and the drafters of the Fourth Geneva Convention did not anticipate <clears throat> A, an occupation that would last indefinitely into its sixth decade as it is right now. The second point, an occupying power acquires absolutely no rights to annex even a square inch of territory. The, uh, this is made clear by some of the leading international law writers in the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, and as I'll show you, uh, this is obviously the, uh, the position of the international community, certainly since 1967. But any attempt to annex territory, either by de facto means, uh, so-called temporary means, or de jure means, by, by a formal declaration of annexation, is absolutely prohibited. Third point, um, the occupying power must govern during the time that it's in, it's in authority in the best interest of the population under occupation. That means that all of his administrative efforts should be towards ensuring that the uh, occupying population is receiving obviously sufficient, um, sufficient food, shelter, education, that it's being put back into its feet again, and that institutions that either existed or should exist in order for the occupying people under occupation to resume full sovereignty ought to be built for their interests. The only time that the occupying power can look to its own interests is with respect to the military security of its troops on the, on the ground. That's the only exception to the rule. And fourth and finally, an occupying power must govern in good faith, i.e. we're not going to annex, we're not going to stay here very long, and they must follow both international law and the directions of the international community to a T. I submit to you, uh, and I've done this in a report of mine back in 2017 to the UN General Assembly, that Israel is in acute violation of all four of these fundamental requirements. Among other issues that, uh, that govern the behavior of the occupying power is that um, collective punishment is absolutely forbidden under Article 33 of the 14th Geneva Convention. One of my, my report last year uh, I found that among other things, the 14 year old blockade on Gaza is a form of collective punishment and therefore is illegal. And I'm not the first person to say that. Uh, both uh, Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon have said that the, uh, that the siege on Gaza amounts to collective punishment and therefore is illegal. And of course the Palestinian people as the people under occupation are deemed to be protected people and enjoy all of the rights that are guaranteed in the, in the uh, Fort Geneva Convention. So what's Israel's <clears throat> response to this? Israel's arguments, which is, it has held since almost the very beginning of the occupation, is that the uh, Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, are not are disputed territories. There was neither in Egypt between 1948 and 1967, nor Jordan during the same time period, held proper, legitimate, recognized sovereignty over those particular Palestinian territories. And therefore, if there was no prior legitimate sovereign, therefore there is no occupation now. And Israel has as good a title as any other country, in fact, a better title, they would say, than any other country to these lands. They also argue that the key cor cornerstone uh, document, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 242 from November of 1967, is, is, was deliberately meant to be ambiguous 
and it allowed Israel to keep some of the territory it conquered in 1967. And I'll quote there, it says withdrawal, it calls for withdrawal of, of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. And where you see the X, Israel says, if we were meant to vacate all of the territory, then they would have put the in front of territories. Now, mind you, that argument is somewhat uh, undermined. If you look at the French, which is equally uh, applicable in interpretation of UN Security Council resolutions, it says the territoire occupé, which has a, a more fulsome meaning than simply territories occupied. So those, this is again, a very lonely argument being made by, by Israel. In contrast, the international consensus is that the, ter the territories are fully occupied, they are not disputed, and therefore the Fourth Geneva Convention winds up applying. Indeed, the Security Council has stated on 22 occasions since 1967 that the Fourth Geneva Convention applies in full to the Palestinian territory, including to Gaza, which Israel says that it vacated in 2005 and has no further uh, responsibility for under, under international law. Uh, this is one of the most frequently commented upon issues in the world today by the Security Council. Um, so it, to my sense, it's an impregnable argument that is raised by the international community and has virtually no following among any international scholars, among those, except for those who might be a voice piece for the Israeli occupation. The Security Council and in, in several of its resolutions on um, uh, the occupation, and you see there are strongly deplored Israel's non-compliance and it demands that it immediately and scrupulously apply the convention. This has never been followed through by, by the occupying power. And this, uh, the endorsements by the uh, Security Council have found uh, further favor by the ruling of the International Court of Justice in, in 2004, where it said that the court finds that the Fort Geneva Convention is applicable to the Palestinian territories occupied by, by Israel. So when you think of all of the leading political and judicial bodies in the international system that hold our highest respect, uh, the Human Rights Council, the, the General Assembly, the Security Council, and then the, uh, the judicial body, the International Court of Justice is the highest judicial body in the international system. All of them have said without reservation that the Fort Geneva Convention applies and, and, there, and there is no merit at all to the Israeli uh, position. So the next area I wanna look at then has to do with the question of annexation. Um, uh, annexation under international law has been strictly prohibited since the very beginning of the modern world in 1945. Article two of the Charter of the United Nations is generally interpreted as, as uh, banning the right of countries to, uh, to annex. And this was drafted specifically uh, into the Charter of the United Nations during the drafting years in 1944 and 1945, because they said one of the leading causes of the Second World War, and indeed the First World War before it, was the non-prohibition on countries who seek to, uh, who are acquisitive and who seek to be able to expand their borders. They said, if we now have a position that international borders are involatile, that they cannot be moved, and that the world will not recognize any attempt by any acquisitive power to expand its borders illegitimately, then we have removed a major source of war in the modern world. And the key resolution with respect to this, articulating this is again, this UN Security Council Resolution 242 in November 1967, where it said, and this is at the very beginning, uh, the, the, pre the prelude to the, uh, of the uh, uh, resolution, where it said, we are emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. And this is why that Israeli, Israeli interpretation of, um, of 242 with the missing the uh, is so uh, is so at odds with modern international law, is that if this was the this was in the uh, the opening statements of uh, um, of Security Council 242, then it means that any subsequent wording in Resolution 242 has to be interpreted in light of this fundamental you cannot annex principle endorsed uh, at the beginning of the resolution, and we now see that uh, with the 2010 amendments 
to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, they have now added annexation as a war, as a crime of aggression under the 1998 Rome Statute. And I'm expecting that this will likely become one of the files on the prosecutor's desk at the International Criminal Court when it, uh, as it investigates uh, what files, if any, to, to forward to, uh, to uh, the possibility of a trial. Of course, it's all within the decision of the prosecutor what to do. He could, he could, he could advance all of the files, some of the files or none of them. But I am certain that uh, annexation as a crime of aggression will be deemed to be one of the files that he is, he, the new prosecutor will take this position in about three weeks time, will be reviewing um, in, uh, in the course of his formal investigation. What is Israel's position with respect to this? It says again that its ability to annex East Jerusalem was because it's of its pre-standing position that Israel was, was illegitimately uh, occupied by Jordan in 1967 and that it has as good a right as any to be able to occupy this territory. In Jerusalem, obviously, it, it, uh, in 1967, through a Knesset vote in the 19, sorry, 1967 and a cabinet vote, then in 1980 in a Knesset vote, it formally annexed East Jerusalem to, to Israel. Um, it, in the process, has created two, 13 settlements uh, within the expanded borders of uh, East Jerusalem with about 225,000 Israeli settlers. And it's constructed a wall that separates East Jerusalem from the Palestinian West Bank. And indeed, where that wall goes through, it even separates some East Jerusalem Palestinians from, uh, from the city. Interestingly enough, uh, Israel annexed the, uh, the Syrian Golan Heights in 1981, and that was recognized by the Trump administration in, I believe, 2019. And that, has yet, that recognition has yet to be undone by the Biden administration. You know, if Israel had a weak position in wanting to say, well, we can annex East Jerusalem because it was never uh, formally a part of a, any other country. You know, they have no argument at all with respect to annexing the Syrian Golan Heights aside from the fruits of war, because every country had recognized that the Syrian Golan Heights were a uh, uh, integral part of, uh, of, of Syria up until 1967 and remains an integral part of, of Syria. No other country besides the United States has given recognition to Israel's position on the annexation and incorporation of the Golan Heights into Israel. And as you would have all known, the Trump uh, Peace to Prosperity Plan um, uh, would have allowed Israel to annex around 30 to 35 percent of the uh, of the West Bank. So what has been the response of the uh, of the United Nations with respect to this? Well that principle I mentioned a few slides ago of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war or by force in the in resolution 242 has been subsequently restated by the UN Security Council in 11 subsequent resolutions regarding the Israeli occupation including resolution 2334 in November two, in December 2016. Uh, in 1980, immediately after the Knesset vote to annex East Jerusalem, the UN Security Council <coughs> resolution passed two, UN Security Council passed two resolutions stating that Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem was null and void and was a flagrant violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And it has gone on as well on various occasions to strongly deplore Israel's contravention of its anti-annexation resolutions and criticize the failure of Israel to show any regard for the resolutions of the General Assembly and the Security Council. So my next point has to do with the uh, Israeli settlements. Um, this is the um, uh, this is the archipelago. The, there's there are two maps side by side. That the, one done by the United Nations uh, and one done by a French publication. But th this is the West Bank, and including East Jerusalem, and it's thick um, with uh, with the 250 plus Israeli settlements that are throughout the uh, the West Bank, both. Uh, in populated areas such as Jerusalem and Hebron, uh, th through the um, through the uh, highlands and the spine of the uh, of the West Bank, and into the Jordan Valley as well. It's very few areas in the West Bank outside of the densely populated Palestinian centers, not not including Jerusalem and Hebron, 
where you will where you, where you won't find Israeli settlements. There, there presently are um, between in East Jerusalem and the West Bank roughly 680,000 settlers. And the archipelago here is basically areas uh, A uh, and B, which is 167 islands of disconnected land. Palestinians could not go from one area of, of the uh, of their archipelago to another without going through Israeli checkpoints. And obviously, just like in Gaza, uh, well, even more so in Gaza, they have no external border to the outside world. Any ability of a Palestinian to be able to travel to the outside world has to go through Israeli occupied territory. So international law and the Israeli settlements, this, this plus the annexation is probably uh, the area that has the widest possible international consensus that these are illegal. The st starting point is the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, which you see at the top, which says that occupying powers cannot deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. That very purpose is to ensure that a power who's become a, an occupying power uh, develops no inquisitive interest in wanting to annex part or all of, uh, of those lands. And the safest way historically to do that is by moving your populations into these areas and creating facts on the ground that if they last long enough and the population builds up to be big enough, cannot be reversed by the international community. Uh, a very famous uh, report in 1993 from the UN Economic and Social Council said that the range of rights violated by population transfers uh, and the implementation of settlers places this phenomenon in the category of mass violations of human rights. And then you see the most recent UN Security Council resolution on the, on the occupation, which said that the settlements have no legal validity and they constitute a flagrant violation under international law. That was, this was passed in the waning days of the Obama administration. And let me just put, put this out as a side point. When you hear people argue that the UN is obsessed with passing resolutions all the time condemning Israel. There are two points to recall. One, the resolutions aren't critical of Israel. They're critical of the Israeli occupation. The resolutions don't address issues with inside Israel beside, uh, uh, behind its 48 borders. They are addressing an international issue of an, of an uh, occupation. Um, and so I, the second point is just escape me. It'll come back to me in a minute. The most recent reiteration of this is in the Rome Statute of 1998, where the, the prohibition against civilian settlements in occupied territory from the Geneva Convention has now been strengthened uh, and redefined as a war crime. And most countries in Western Europe uh, and, uh, and my own country in Canada um, have incorporated the Rome Statute into domestic legislation. So this is both international law as well as being domestic law, that the transfer directly or indirectly by the occupying power of parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies constitutes a war crime. Um, and that indeed is the, is the subject of the UN report that I'm delivering in July to the UN Human Rights Council. It is the status of the uh, Israeli settlements under the Rome Statute. So the key facts, uh, which may be familiar with to many of you, um, is that this is the primary Israeli tool to ensure democratic uh, demographic growth and uh, demogra demographic permanency in the occupied territories. This gives them the claim for sovereignty, which, as I said, has been re in implicitly recognized by the United States and by the parties uh, who work on the various peace processes over the last 30 years, is that Israel has been permitted to negotiate over the settlements as opposed to being told international law and a rights-based approach forbids all settlements. Therefore, those are off the bargaining table. There are 250 plus Jewish only settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. The population, I've seen various accounts, but it seems to me the most reliable is that in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, they now amount to about 685,000 uh, settlers, growing by about 15 to 25,000 settlers uh, a year. Um, in 2020, Peace Now said that um, there were oh, more than 12,000 housing units, and you generally can multiply those housing units by a population of five per unit, um, have been approved by Israel. And that was the largest number of housing units 
for the settlements approved by the uh, government authority since peace now began taking those um, um, those measurements, I believe, starting in 2008. So I, I won't go through this in detail, but the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights issues an annual report on the human rights impact of the Israeli settlements. And these are among the key areas of discrimination and adverse impact uh, upon the uh, Palestinians living in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Two of them I'm going to point out. The second one down is the whole array of differential rights and laws. Um, obviously, as Michael Safari said yesterday, uh, Israeli settlers living in a settlement uh, outside of Nablus, um, are, they have all the rights of, a, of an Israeli living in, um, in Tel Aviv or in Haifa. If they're charged criminally, they, they go to an Israeli court and they have all the due process protections, including the right to a lawyer to be able to protect them. A Palestinian living in the same geographic area enjoys none of those uh, rights uh, or coverage by laws. If they're charged with murder, um, they would be charged under Israeli military law, which is a conviction rate of well over 99% when it comes to uh, Palestinians. And at the bottom, the denial of self-determination. If the settlements are the engine of the occupation, there'd be no point in Israel wanting to continue the occupation if it wasn't for uh, the almost 700,000 settlers and the 250,000 settler settlements they have there. This is the key. Uh, this is the key form of being able to deny Palestinian self-determination. Indeed, when if you looked carefully at the map proposed by the March 2020 Trump plan, it said uh, it, it, it incorporated every single settlement into Israeli uh, into the proposed Israeli annexation and left the Palestinians again with this little Bantu stand in the middle of the of the West Bank. That would have been, if the Palestinians accepted that, that would have been a brand new definition of what a state means in modern political science. So the point of all of this, and there are many Israeli statements to this effect, that the more settlements we, we build and the thicker our settlement population, we not only have created a internal large settlement lobby on our governments, never to give them up, but we've denied any space for a, another Arab state, uh, an Arab state west of the uh, Jordan River. And my, fa my final point, I'm going to be brief on this because I know that one of our panelists today will be, will be commenting upon this. But just very briefly, to my mind, this is the missing point with respect to the occupation. <coughs> International law has created three, at least three, important rules which virtually all countries have bought into that uh, ensure that there is going to be <laughs> accountability if international laws are disobeyed by any by any member states. Um, if the common article number one of all of the four uh, Geneva Conventions of 1949 require that all of the high contracting parties, which includes virtually every country in the world, to ensure respect. And the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross says that is not an an empty uh, claim that has is full of legal meaning that compel legal responsibility on all other high contracting parties to bring violations to the Fourth Geneva Convention to an end. The Articles 40 and 41 of the 2001 Articles on State Responsibility um, require the international community to cooperate to bring serious violations uh, of human rights and international law to an end. And Article 25 of the Charter of the United Nations says that members of the United Nations agree to accept and to carry out decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the Charter. Israel is in violation of at least 30 Security Council uh, resolutions since the late 1960s with respect to annexation, with respect to the settlements, with respect to the occupation, and so on. And the United, and the United Nations has never called upon uh, the uh, Israel to comply or face consequences under its solemn obligations under Article 25. Um, and you look at the centrality of, uh, of accountability, and this is the tension between international law requires and what real politique will wind up allowing. You can see that um, uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said in 2016 that tackling impunity with respect to Israel must be the highest uh, priority. The German ambassador in 2019 to the UN said very astutely that international law, you cannot cherry pick. 
international law is not a menu a la carte that you can pick and choose from. When you buy in, you buy into everything. And the special rapporteur, um, here, me, um, said that the international supervision of the 53-year-old Israeli occupation of Palestine illustrates that between international law and accountability, there is an enormous gap between promise and performance. International law should not be an umbrella that folds up when it rains. I'm getting very near to my end and I know I'm getting close to the end of my time. Um, but let me just put this to you because it shocked me, I think, when I first came across this particular resolution shortly after I became Special Rapporteur five or so years ago. In June 2080, almost 41 years ago, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 476. Um, this is in the immediate aftermath of the vote by the Israeli Knesset to annex East Jerusalem. And it said two important things. It said, first of all, that they reaffirmed the overwhelming necessity. This is in 1980, after only 13 years of occupation, the overriding necessity for ending the prolonged occupation of Arab territories. And then they went on, I, that should be number two, my apologies. Then they went on in the very next paragraph and said, we strongly deplore the continued refusal of Israel, the occupying power, to comply with the relevant resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly. So if the occupation was already prolonged in 1980, uh, and if Israel was already had a strong track record of defying the Security Council and the General Assembly by, by 1980, what is it now? Um, you know, the U European Union has called this now a one state reality of unequal rights. And I must say, if I put that term into Google Translate, it comes out apartheid, which of course is what leading human rights organizations have begun to say, Israeli, Palestinian, and international have begun to use that term uh, in, uh, in, the last few, uh, in the last few months. So very quickly, what lies ahead, um, Kofi Annan, in his closing statement, uh, in the last few weeks of his, uh, of his mandate as, as um, Secretary General said, in 2006, he pointed to the centrality of the, uh, of the Israeli, of the Israeli Palestinian conflict, the uh, Israeli occupation of Palestine as a core issue. It's gotta be remain at the top of the international agenda. You see that no other issue, he said, carries such a powerful symbolic and emotive uh, charge affecting people far, um, uh, far from the zone of conflict. And he then went on to say in 2011, in his, uh, in his memoirs, he said he was disturbed, and I'm gonna use his quotes, by the prolonged and sometimes brutal occupation, his words, by Israel. And he lamented the timidity of the Security Council's response. He said, even when the council took positions, it did not establish mechanisms to enforce its will. And he went on to identify a leading source for the council's paralysis. He said, it was the unhealthy possessiveness of the Middle East peace process by the United States of America, uh, unquote, and you may know, the US since 1973 has cast 31 vetoes at the Security Council against draft resolutions critical of the Israeli occupation. In each case, it has been the only Security Council member uh, casting a negative vote. No other permanent member of the Security Council has vetoed a single council resolution critical of the Israeli occupation. And finally, then we have the statement by uh, Daniel Levy, who is a former peace process negotiator, and those who, who uh, if you come across him, you'll know that his commentary uh, and his policy thinking with respect to the Israeli occupation is absolutely top drawer. And he said, human rights and international legality should be our guiding star and no longer be subordinated to the process, to maintaining a peace process that has so publicly failed to deliver. So let me end that there. Um,